Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Thank you uh, so much for uh, joining us for another Palestine in session. And it's such an honor for me to welcome um, our guest, Dr. Imam Mustafa Abu Sway, for this very, very important topic um, relating to Masjid al Aqsa. And uh, I really want to give uh, uh, give this uh, give this topic its just due, considering the situation on the ground today, but also because of its uh, deep and important religious and political history. Without further ado, I want to introduce our our wonderful guest, Dr. Imam Mustafa Abu Sway, who is Dean of the College of Islamic Studies at Al Quds University in Jerusalem. He was appointed as the first holder of the integral chair for the study of Imam Ghazali's work at the Holy Al-Aqsa Mosque and at Al-Quds University in 2012. He taught at the International Islamic University in Malaysia and was a visiting Fulbright Scholar in Residence at the Wilkes Honors College at Florida Atlantic University, as well as a visiting professor at Bard College in New York. Among his publications are three books on Imam Al-Ghazali, Islamic Epistemology, The Case of Al-Ghazali, Fatawa Al-Ghazali, and a Treasury of Al-Ghazali. Professor Abu Sway is a member of Hashemite Fund for the Restoration of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock and the Islamic Waqf Council in Jerusalem. Um, I'm so sorry, uh, Dr. Mustafa Abu Sway, that I had to cut your bio short, but there's a lot that I want you to get to get into. Um, it's such a, first of all, it's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Um, thank you for agreeing to do this. And I want to start off with kind of an overarching question because we hear a lot about, um, you know, there's different vari variations of its of its usage depending on who uses the, the term. We hear a lot about um, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the compound. We hear a lot about um, Haram al-Sharif or what Jews call the Temple Mount. I want you to just you know, start us off by explaining what is an Aqsa Mosque? Why is it such an important topic? And I want you to take as much time as um, as you as you want to just flush that flush that out for us. And again, thank you for thank you for joining us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Alhamdulillah kathiran Well, thank you. Jazakumullah khairan for uh, having me. And definitely speaking about Aqsa Mosque is. Uh, uh, it's refreshing. It also uh, covers some of the, uh, I would say, the contemporary uh, misconceptions and also the uh, the reality on the ground. But the uh, what is Al-Aqsa Mosque? Uh, so yes, uh, many names circulate in uh, in the media and amongst Muslims themselves. Sometimes I find that the use of Al-Aqsa Mosque is uh, uh, is not always uh, accurate. Al-Aqsa Mosque. According to uh, Mujir Din Hanbali, who literally died uh, 500 years ago, uh, Mujir Din Hanbali, for those who are fortunate to visit Jerusalem, uh, um, is the only one who is buried uh, right next to the uh, between three churches on the foot of Mount of uh, of Olives. In his book Al Uns Al Jalil fi Tarikh Al Quds Wal Khalil, which is a history of Jerusalem and Hebron. He said that uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque is the name of the space for all the buildings uh, are novel, meaning that they have been added on. And we know very well from Islamic history that Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab built the first uh, uh, building in the southernmost part. And uh, the Umayyads developed the, uh, uh, the, uh, the mosque. Uh, and most of what you see at Al-Aqsa Mosque today goes back to the Umayyad uh, period. So by 695, uh, by 695, so almost like uh, uh, 60 years after the death of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this wonderful place has been already uh, adorned with these buildings. But going back to Majid al-Din Hanbali, he said that uh, it's the name of the space, and he himself measured twice the length and width of Al-Aqsa Mosque from uh, the northern walls to the southern walls. The, from the east, he specified it was uh, from... Uh, Bab al Rahma, all the way to the Tenkaziya school on the uh, western part, uh, western wall of Al Aqsa Mosque. The Tenkaziya school uh, partially exists on the uh, western uh, nave corridor, 
uh, arched really uh, um, corridor on the western side of the mosque and uh, the other part of the uh, of the tenkazi is in the uh, is in the old city proper next to the gate of chain bab silsila and this uh, school has been confiscated after 1967 and is used by israeli security uh, forces until uh, today so mujid al hanbali or the portrayed and i'm using mujid al hanbali because people look for a uh, for an original uh, text and here we have 500 years old text that speaks about the uh, the mosque the mosque we talk about 144 donums, 36 acres for those who are using uh, acres and uh, the uh, uh, within the mosque of course we talk about the what you can see on the surface so both like many mosques around the world like the uh, mosque the umayyad mosque in uh, in uh, in damascus which is very similar to uh, uh, al-aqsa mosque because again it's umayyad the architecture the uh, mosaic motifs for example uh, the mosque in Medina, the mosque in Mecca, the uh, Sultan Ahmed, the blue mosque in, uh, in Istanbul, all of them have an open space. And uh, so the open space, the, uh, uh, the courtyards, the Dome of the Rock, the Qibli, the subterranean halls, we have many subterranean halls. Uh, sometimes we have the Marwani in the south uh, southeastern corner of the mosque. We have the uh, what we call sometimes the ancient Al-Aqsa. These are two corridors that lead to the Umayyad palaces that were outside the perimeter of the uh, of the mosque on the southern side of the mosque, which is on the southern side also of the old city. The Al-Aqsa mosque shares part of the wall of the old city on uh, uh, part of the southern uh, wall of the old city and part of the eastern wall of the old city. So at the same time, it's a wall of the old city and it's a wall of Al-Aqsa uh, mosque. Uh, the uh, so in terms of uh, uh, merit uh, whether one prays under the uh, olive trees in the uh, qibli or in the beautiful dome of the rock uh, it's the same uh, religious uh, uh, merit so uh, uh, so the uh, so for and i would say for example that the use of these holes sometimes differs according to the time of the year uh, in the qibli we have men and women uh, throughout the year, except that when we have a very large crowd, like for example during Ramadan, ladies take over the Dome of the Rock. This is a beautiful building. Let them enjoy it. Really, not only the building itself, but even in the vicinity, and you'll find you'll find uh, Boy Scouts uh, really making sure that men do not really intrude. They will, you know, they uh, they make sure that uh, they they are at at all the entrances, uh, literally. Uh, when you ascend to the uh, Dome of the Rock uh, Plateau, uh, you have these, uh, we call them mawazin. Uh, we talk about arches. Uh, you have one on the uh, eastern side. You have uh, on the northern uh, side. You have uh, three on the western side, two on the southern side. Uh, so you have basically these Boy Scouts uh, making sure during Ramadan that uh, men do not really uh, you know, go beyond a certain point. The Dome of the Rock itself, uh, which continues to define Jerusalem, which continues continues to define uh, the aesthetic uh, also uh, Jerusalem. The beauty of the uh, Dome of the Rock is unimaginable. Uh, talking about it, you know, even coming for a short period is not enough. It's... Uh, uh, it's really uh, it's a work of art that is unprecedented. One of the oldest, really, uh, the uh, architectural uh, um, edifices of uh, Islamic uh, civilization. Uh, what you see today, it's octagonal. The walls, uh, you have eight uh, sides to the uh, structure uh, itself. Might allude, why eight? In my thinking, there is nothing. Uh, it's, a, it's a personal conjecture, but uh, could it be that the uh, uh, the architects uh, uh, thought about the ويحملوا عشر ربك يوم إذن فوقهم ثمانية that uh, you have eight um, um, angels uh, carrying the uh, throne of uh, thy Lord uh, on the day of uh, uh, of judgment. That's basically, as I said, a conjecture, but it did withstand, uh, you know, the earthquakes, unlike the Qibli, 
which was hit in uh, 779 by a major earthquake. It was demolished. And Al-Mahdi, the Abbasid uh, Caliph, uh, could only rebuild uh, five, uh, uh, five uh, naves um, of the original 15. And uh, later on, during the Fatimid period, there was another earthquake. So they renovated five plus two. So they, we have today seven out of 15 originally naves in the south. Going back to the Dome of the, uh, of the Rock, uh, what you uh, what you see uh, is you have um, gates leading inside Al-Aqsa Mosque, north, south, east, and west, and that will leave you with uh, four uh, sides without walls, but they have uh, windows uh, on the on the outer uh, on the uh, octagonal wall. You have Surah Yasin from the Quran on the you know on the on the drum of the uh, dome. You will you have. Uh, chapter 17 surah al-isra and on the on the inside of the on the drum of the uh, dome on the inside it is surah taha which basically both uh, surah al-isra and surah taha speak about the uh, you know like in surah al-isra one verse about the night journey journey at night if you will uh, this is prophet muhammad sallallahu uh, alaihi wasallam of course and uh, surah taha is the same uh, it does begin with the uh, Prophet ﷺ. and in both in both chapters, uh, both surahs in the in the Quran, the the narrative shifts to Sayyidina Musa السلام, and the children of uh, of Israel. Uh, on the octagonal wall on the inside, facing east, facing Mount of Olives, which is very appropriate really because Mount of Olives is the seat of many uh, major events. Uh, in the history of uh, uh, Christianity, you have verses about uh, uh, Jesus Christ, peace upon him, and you'll have two, uh, uh, though in the Quran you have, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, a palm tree, which uh, Maryam, Mary, Mary alayhi salam, uh, had to shake, which is also a, a miraculous thing, and she will have uh, fresh dates. So you'll have these uh, these verses about both of them, uh, on the wall facing Mount of Olives and adorned in mosaic by by palm trees and of course you see clusters of uh, of dates there. As I said, it's uh, it's full. And in fact, the uh, when I spoke about the uh, the Surah Taha on the inside, uh, the uh, this is a manuscript. It's mosaic, but it's a manuscript. It's a manuscript that goes. It's not ink. It's not parchment. It's not paper, but some mosaic of the it's a uh, it's a manuscript of the Quran. So those who would like to study an ancient uh, you know text of the Quran come to Al Aqsa Mosque. We do have a manuscript center, massive. We have a large team of uh, uh, of uh, of specialists who uh, are uh, working on ancient manuscripts that we do have at Al Aqsa Mosque. We have thousands of uh, of books and documents, uh, historical documents. And uh, a lot, very large team, uh, wonderful team that is working on these manuscripts. We have uh, a copy of Ihya Ulum al-Din. We have the uh, oldest copy of uh, uh, now is uh, 40. The, the, you know very well if you know the 40 hadith of now, they are a little bit more than 40. But the 40 uh, hadith of uh, now, the oldest manuscript is at Al-Aqsa. Uh, mosque is a very rich. We have several libraries at Al Aqsa Mosque. It is adorned by uh, many schools on the northern side and on the western side. So, for example, uh, con the the contemporary educational scene at Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, we have uh, uh, three functioning schools in the northern uh, the northern wall of uh, uh, of Al Aqsa Mosque has two schools, two different schools. Uh, one uh, under the uh, waqf for uh, for for basically it's a, a, a middle high school for uh, for boys and on the western side we have a girls school a middle high school for girls uh, using al ashrafiya school al ashrafiya school uh, you need you, one needs to understand that uh, the uh, the mamluk basically uh, contributed to the development of uh, the buildings at uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and they left behind this wonderful uh, Sabil Qaytabai, for example. It's a 
it, I mean, nothing like that. You'll find something in Cairo, similar architecture, very beautiful on the outside, on the inside. But the Ashrafiya school itself, uh, one cannot even start speaking about the beauty of the school. And I love to say that they brought uh, uh, a Christian engineer from Cairo with them. So the architecture of Sabil Qaitabai and the Ashrafiya school uh, is the same, and of course, the same degree of beauty. By the way, the manuscript center uses the first floor of the Ashrafiya school, the upper floors for the uh, for the girls' school. Wherever you turn your eyes uh, uh, at Al-Aqsa Mosque, there is uh, uh, rich history. And of course, uh, uh, scholars who uh, spent uh, years uh, writing, teaching, uh, reading uh, texts with their... So we do have also... Uh, uh, documented uh, documentation of who, which scholar reading what and where at Al-Aqsa Mosque. This is also part of the history of Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I'm sure there's a lot more to say on that. Uh, uh, you know, uh, one misconception that people have when they, when they hear the, the, the term is that they think of it as just one small structure. So when we say Al-Aqsa, we're, we're referring to the whole area. That's why that's why you talked about Qibla Mosque, you talked about the Dome of the Rock, Qibla Sahra, and all of its surroundings and environs. So it encompasses that whole entire um, that whole entire space. Yeah, and that's really a misconception, yeah. It's a misconception. It's, it's not one structure, it's not one building, it's not the Qibli, definitely not. And uh, I see from the, uh, you know, many people, or of course, Either they are ignorant or deliberately they try to say that right. it's the uh, the Qibli. I, I I need to say two things. Now UNESCO, which is part of the uh, UN, the United Nations, uh, uh, adopted the Al Aqsa Mosque slash Al Haram al Sharif to make sure that we speak about the whole uh, the whole uh, area, every single thing within uh, the parameters of the uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. But it this reminds me of. Uh, uh, Lieberman, uh, when he was uh, the Israeli uh, foreign uh, minister, he sent an A4 to the uh, embassies in uh, foreign embassies in Tel Aviv, defining what Al-Aqsa Mosque is. He said that it's only the very the southernmost building, the Qibli, which is really erroneous. This is why I started with Mujir Din Hanbali. 500 years ago, there were no Zionists. There was no Zionist project. There was no Israel. There was no. So when Mujir Din Hanbali spoke about Al-Aqsa Mosque being the whole thing. Measuring it twice for verification, the length and the width, specifying from where to where, he was not responding to any claims by anyone else. No, um, that's definitely a very important point uh, to mention. Now, there is there is a mechanism in place for how um, how to maintain a aqsa, and there are there are rules involved. So we hear a lot about the Islamic Waqf. Yes, and what is known as the status quo arrangement. So, what is this? What does this really entail? What are what are the what are the ins and outs of this uh, of this arrangement, and what is the Islamic Waqf? Okay, the Islamic Waqf. Okay, the word Waqf it is in itself. Uh, it's basically the endowment, and Muslims have been endowed from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. There were endowments. And uh, of course, historically, they became so many that you needed a body to take care of them. And uh, from the, uh, uh, of course, before the 97, uh, Jerusalem was, of course, part of and parcel of the uh, Jordanian, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, so the Ministry of Waqf, the Jordanian Ministry of Waqf took care of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Waqf in Jerusalem, Laksa Mosque and everything else. And the uh, Hashemites for more than a century, uh, beginning with the uh, Sharif Hussein, began began the uh, taking care of the holy places in Jerusalem, especially the uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. But officially, and it is recognized all over the world today that His Majesty King Abdullah II is the custodian of the uh, holy places, the Muslim and Christian holy places in uh, Jerusalem. And this is very important so that people would know. Uh, people should know, in fact, that His Majesty uh, 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 financed really a renovation of the uh, Sepulchre Church also. So they do support uh, 
the waqf but the 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 department waqf in jerusalem the administration is part and parcel of the ministry of the jordanian waqf until today and it has about 1000 employees one might ask the question, why 1,000 employees? Why, why do you need uh, 1,000? In fact, we might need more. Uh, we have clinics to run. So, for example, during Ramadan, even our two clinics at al Mosque are not enough to take care of 250,000 people like last Friday. Okay? Yesterday, it was the number 130,000 uh, Muslims uh, prayed at al Mosque. I believe that basically the... Uh, the uh, the checkpoints, uh, the military checkpoints surrounding Jerusalem did not allow Muslims the freedom to uh, arrive the, like the Friday before that. And uh, when you have 250,000 people, there are people who are um, vulnerable, people who are sick, people who might uh, have a stroke, sons, you know, people whom, uh, um, you know, pe dehydration, whatever is the case. So uh, our two clinics are not enough. This is why we have uh, a consortium of hospitals Palestinian hospitals in East Jerusalem, who send their own, uh, you know, medics and, um, you know, uh, uh, volunteers, and they establish, you know, uh, tents surrounding all the al uh, uh, Mosque Haram al-Sharif uh, to take care of, the, uh, of anyone who gets sick. We have engineers, we have lawyers, we have accountants, we have teachers, we have imams, we have muazzin, we have, you know, uh, guards, Name it, uh, you know, we uh, it comes to uh, 1,000. The waqf uh, in Jerusalem takes care of uh, uh, around uh, 120 mosques. So it's not only Al-Aqsa Mosque. We have many mosques dotting the old city of Jerusalem. And also within the, within the, uh, uh, the municipality, uh, it, like within the walls, the separation uh, wall, uh, really, and the Waqf also uh, uh, takes care of uh, about 50 schools uh, in, uh, uh, in Jerusalem. It's under the uh, supervision of the, uh, uh, the Waqf. So it's a massive institution. And, uh, uh, you know, thankfully, the, uh, you know, the uh, Jordan uh, does not really uh, spare any effort in, you know, supporting the Department of Waqf, supporting Al-Aqsa Mosque, the, even the Christian uh, holy places. And in, it goes beyond really the uh, the uh, the waqf. So on daily basis, the waqf uh, takes care of, uh, as I said, all these institutions outside the uh, Aqsa Mosque. But of course, for us, uh, what we uh, see and what we pay attention to usually is Al, uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. Uh, whether it's really uh, the uh, cleanliness, safety, uh, uh, medical uh, teams. But also the uh, big fight is about the politics, about the narrative, uh, about the chipping at the uh, historical uh, status quo. Historical status quo uh, goes back to 1852. It goes back to the Umayyad, to the Ottoman period. And the, uh, the, the meaning is that originally for the Christians, it does uh, delineate uh, who's who within the sepulcher church, this is why a Muslim family continues to hold the key of the uh, the Sepulchre Church every every morning. Someone, uh, uh, you know, the, the, this family that has the uh, the key goes to the uh, to the Sepulchre Church and opens. You know, there's a, a monk uh, uh, from inside goes up on a ladder, and so it goes both ways to open the the, the church itself. Uh, but of course, for us uh, the, uh, at Al-Aqsa Mosque, since 1967, the status quo that existed on the eve of the 1967 war uh, continues. So the Waqf continues to take care of the, of the mosque. The Israeli, you know, Israel as an entity that exists, you know, uh, qua, uh, you know uh, an occupier, uh, it is governed by international law. And the their security forces should be outside the the mosque, not inside. Everything inside should be the uh, the uh, under the authority of uh, uh, of the waqf. Of course, uh, since Sharon uh, broke into the mosque with a, a couple of thousand uh, uh, you know uh, soldiers and uh, security forces, from that day things began to deteriorate 
a little bit, you know. Uh, so, for example, the 2003 Israeli police took it upon themselves to bring uh, people inside the mosque without the consent of the Waqf. And this is why the Waqf continues to ask, to demand that we go back to the status quo ante, basically that, that which existed until the year 2000 when the Waqf was in full control of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the mosque or the affairs of the uh, of the mosque yeah and that's um and that Sharon visit that you just mentioned that's what essentially precipitated the second intifada and yes. that's um uh, and we are here 20 23 years later in addition to um you know um changing the status quo as it as it was pre to pre 2000 for the past 20 something something years israel's excavation project has really damaged the infrastructure of of aluxa and not to not to mention a lot of homes of uh of palestinians that live in jerusalem in the aluxa area so how has that project how has the zionist excavation project impacted the aluxa and is that something that we should that we should uh be cognizant of and be worried about we there there were basically uh, attempts to uh, reach there was once a dig uh, that went inside the aqsa mosque in the direction of the dome rock the waqf discovered that and they uh, uh, they closed the uh, that that dig uh, with concrete um uh, uh Anruwa school outside the Aqsa Mosque on the southern side, the floor collapsed with the girls in school really, uh, you know, going uh, literally uh, falling into the uh, into the dig, into the hole that was, uh, uh, you know, uh, caused by the excavation beneath the school, meaning it was going northward in the direction of Aqsa Mosque. I have noticed for many years that uh, there was a, a project uh, really beneath Al-Aqsa Mosque on the uh, southern side of the, of course, the uh, the, uh, the old city is at the Gain, which shares with the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque, the southern wall. And uh, really, we don't know uh, what, what what is going on. And the only thing that I know personally uh, about the, uh, you know, whatever took place beneath Al-Aqsa Mosque is that there, uh, a few years ago, uh the uh, norwegians they uh, uh, arranged with the uh, israelis that a delegation of experts from the unesco the norwegians themselves israeli and jordanian uh, experts would go uh, into the tunnels and you know whatever is there uh, beneath al aqsa mosque the last at the last minute, the uh, you know the Israel Israel withdrew, the, and basically cancelled the arrangement. So we really we don't have a clear picture of uh, what goes on beneath uh, uh, Al Aqsa Mosque. So that's that's ex that's what I can say. Re most recently, uh, the uh, Aqsa uh, Mosque um, the Waqf employees uh, videotaped. Uh, the uh, settlers or whoever was going working on the southern side uh, plucking stones from the wall of uh, Al Aqsa Mosque uh, or from nearby, and they were destroying them. Literally, they were smashing uh, with hammers, at, as if basically to conceal. Uh, but they they videotaped them, and uh, this is documented. Yeah, um, it's just. Uh... It always worries me when when I hear more and more digging underneath, um, and you know, it, it, when you when you're talking about a stru structures that large, uh, you know, you don't want to you don't want to think the worst could happen. I'm. I think there's a little bit of I th okay. I think there's also a little bit of uh, uh, politics in the uh, sure uh, the the uh, the. Let's talk, for example, about about the uh, the tunnel west of uh, uh, you know uh, the Burak Wall, and the just continues northbound. 
but it does go uh, beneath Al-Aqsa Mosque in the direction of the Umariya school. Uh, is this in violation of uh, um, international law? I think yes. Uh, does it uh, does it did it uh, cause damage in the buildings above? Yes. Uh, to 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 basically calculate the uh, the danger, you need basically uh, independent engineers, uh, structural engineers going into these places and basically assess you know the the damage. The rest of the talk will be uh, rather uh, political, of course. Well, so, <laughs> do they allow engineers? I don't think so. Uh, independent engineers to go and check what's going on beneath. But uh, as I said, the most important thing is that East Jerusalem, I'm talking about, you know, what's on the table right now. Sure. East Jerusalem is part of the West Bank, along with the Gaza Strip. These are occupied uh, Palestinian territories. It's international law. Israel should withdraw. Unfortunately, uh, you know, Jerusalem is one of the uh, final uh, resolution issues. If also is still living, if anybody is still believing in that. But the idea is rather than dealing with the uh, minute details of, you know, what's, what, you know, what damage could be here and impact on the environment and on, on education. And if we keep dealing with the, uh, with the issues as uh, piecemeal, I think uh, we should uh, retrieve in the narrative about really uh, the elephant in the room, which is the occupation. We need to end occupation. That's the uh, that's the important thing. Absolutely. And speaking of the occupation and politics, um, it seems as though, uh, uh, Dr. Abu Sway, that during Ramadan, Zionist violence increases in ferocity. And this year is no exception, as you know, uh, as we see in the news, and as you as you witnessed there. What do you? Th why do you think that is? And what does that mean to the status quo arrangement? Does that does that does that make it uh, more fragile that that this now this is a recurring every single year during Ramadan? Okay, uh, let me contextualize basically the, uh, there is violence throughout the year, there's violence from day one, there's violence throughout the, you know, occupation, it's not benign, uh, even during the government of uh, Yair Lapid, more than 200 Palestinians lost their lives, uh, you know, confiscating land, you know, the, uh, destroying homes, uh, name it, we still uh, have all of this, uh, you know, ongoing. Uh, the uh, there are a couple of uh, issues uh, here. Uh, one of them is that uh, going back to 2003, again the Israeli police allowed basically settlers to go on uh, to, to basically to uh, and they have changed the course of visitation. They go eastward from the Mograbi Gate all the way to the eastern part, literally next to the wall of the uh, the eastern wall of the uh, old city of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Then they move northward, northward, north, northward, to the uh, to the uh, uh, Bab al Rahmah area, which they call in English it is named Bab al Rahmah's Gate of Mercy, but in English it's known as the Golden Gate. And they prohibit Muslims from praying in you know on that level in that area, especially when there are no uh, when there are settlers there. Then they move a little bit further north and westward. And then they get close uh, to the Dome of the Rock, but they don't go on the plateau, on the courtyard there. Uh, further west, then south, they exit through the Gate of, uh, of Chain. And when it coincides with, uh, with the Jewish, uh, uh, you know, holidays, like this year we have uh, Ramadan, we have uh, Pesach, and we have Easter at the same uh, time. So the Israeli police uh, tries to make sure that there are no Muslims at Al-Aqsa Mosque, Al-Haram al-Sharif, uh, that would challenge the uh, intrusion of those uh, settlers who are always accompanied by uh, Israeli security uh, forces. So this is part of the of the picture. Now, another, another the, the, the new thing is that Bin Gavir is responsible for all these police uh, forces. And yes, we have seen something new. I mean, you know, the world saw at large, you know, the, uh, the barbaric beating of the uh, of the Muslim worshippers with the batons and with the uh, uh, with the rifles and uh, being people being uh, shot with 
so called rubber bullets these are they have metal core with uh, high velocity uh, so someone a young man was on the floor at Laksa Mosque uh, inside the Qibli and uh, he was in severe pain and they would still kick him uh, uh, when they passed by him so there is there is you know uh, uh, violence being severe should not be in such a position he is a convicted criminal there are f there are 52 cases against Ben Gvir in the, you know, uh, on his file. He's convicted. I mean, why would you basically entrust someone who is known uh, as a hate monger who belong to, uh, 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 you know, to, uh, he's a Kahanist, uh, some, you know, the, a group that uh, even the United States uh, declared as a terrorist group at the time. So renaming, rebranding themselves does not change the nature of the uh, hate speech that comes, and of course the uh, the ideology and the practice of such you know uh, uh, of such people. This is why we have uh, seen a rise in uh, uh, in uh, in you know in the uh, how violent. But of course we had in the 90, in 1990 we had a massacre at Al Aqsa Mosque, and we have at least one case of documented extrajudicial killing of one person at Al Aqsa Mosque at the time. And the list of the names include elderly people. Their names and their ages are, uh, you know, are uh, at both sides of, of the inter, the northern entrance of the uh, Bab al-Rahma Cemetery. Uh, so violence is uh, is violence, and uh, uh, and of course we talk about the uh, the occupation. The you know, uh, uh, it, it's a mosque. We don't claim that it is a mosque. They claim they have so many claims. That I have so they have so many theories about so many things. We don't claim it has been a mosque for 15 for 15 centuries, 15 centuries, and even it has if it has been a, mo a mosque for one day, it's a mosque. You know, it's uh, and we did not take anything from uh, from them. Uh, Muslims uh, kept the uh, uh, the uh, the Christian churches intact. They respected the uh, their freedom of worship. Uh, the Pact of Umar, it's unique in the history of humanity, not only of Islam and Christianity, between uh, Umar al-Khattab uh, and uh, uh, Patriarch Sophronius, very beautiful document. We still we still celebrate, we cherish the Pact of Umar, and in, in fact, we, we do have this, uh, uh, you know, beautiful uh, relationship between us here in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, a few days ago, we had iftar at the Anglican Church with the presence of the Orthodox Latin and Protestant churches, members of the Waqf uh, Council, we celebrated our uh, shared history. We celebrated our own, uh, you know, uh, 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 social fabric. We celebrated our own, uh, you know, but also our uh, struggle. We realized that in the light of the latest uh, attacks on the Christian churches, on the church of flagellation, and it was a Muslim who stopped the uh, Jewish extremist at the... Uh, uh, there's a church next to the uh, Gethsemane, uh, 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 and again we have a Jewish extremists, uh, two of them. But one of them was caught by, uh, you know, by a Muslim. Uh, he was stopped by a Muslim man. One of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, of those who have who sell few things around the uh, the the churches, who hear the screams and he went and he stopped the the man from uh, uh, inflicting more harm on the. Uh, chair property, but also he attacked the uh, priest who was, have, who was having mass. Uh, the uh, the desecration of some uh, 30 uh, graves of the Anglican uh, cemetery uh, on Mount Sion. So we realize that we are uh, definitely, we are in the, um, uh, you know, we are suffering under uh, uh, these uh, these policies. This is really the uh, reality on the, uh, on the ground. Uh, any uh, any talk about preservation of the uh, historical status quo is lip service on their part. We uh, we have uh, respected our own uh, share. Uh, we don't really uh, um, interfere in other people's business. But this is a mosque and will continue to be uh, a mosque, inshallah. Of course, um, and um, you mentioned you mentioned a lot there. And just for just for our audience. Um, the two individuals that Dr. Abu uh, mentioned, um, uh, Atamar Ben Gavir, um, he there was a special post created for him for this uh, for this uh, 
for this government, uh, national uh, security minister, and he's in and he's in route to potentially having a national guard, basically his own militia, um, and he's also somebody who's convicted. And you mentioned um, uh, his uh, protege um, uh, or um, uh, the individual who he um, who, who he, he shares an, ide an ideology with, Kahanis. You said uh, Meyer Kahana, who was a former. Uh, he was he was formally convicted of of, of terrorism as well, um, so I mean, yeah, you're, we're we're talking about a dangerous uh, a dangerous individual there, and another another thing that I uh, wanted to mention or thank you for uh, mentioning is the fact that this is not just these attacks that do occur, violence that we do see. It's not just against Muslims. It's against Palestinians, which also includes our Christian brothers and brothers and sisters. And you gave and you gave some uh, some some of those examples. Um, I, I really wanted to thank you for mentioning that point because that goes that goes missed sometimes. Is that there is a Palestinian Christian body that lives that have lived for centuries and centuries and are indigenous to the land of Palestine as well and have lived. That's the best, that's the best place of Christianity. Come on, they have been here for two thousand years. I mean, this but there, is... there's always this misconception that you know uh, when you're talking about Palestine, because the overwhelming population is uh, Muslim. That so, and then you think of you think of Al Aqsa. You know, you think it's just it's, it's just Muslims that go there. But you mentioned the uh, Omar Omar ibn al Khattab, brother Allah, and I think that's a phenomenal. One of my favorite examples in history is that he re he refused to pray in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre because he. Uh, he anticipated that potentially that could be converted into a mosque, and that essentially preserved it. I think that's the uh, the. I think it's, it was brilliant. I think he had insight into the field. He was. Uh, we know that you know that the personality of Omar Khattab is 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 special in every respect. He basically realized that had he prayed there, it would have been created as a right later on by future generations of Muslims. He stepped outside and he was right. Where he prayed, Muslims erected later on the Mosque of Omar. But also it does reflect something else. We have church and mosque. I remember, for example, that in Switzerland, they passed a law preventing the uh, building of minarets, you know, in, in, in Switzerland. I thought to myself, why not basically publish every day a picture of a church and mosque that have existed for centuries next to each other? We have plenty of that. In Jerusalem, we have that. In Bethlehem, we have that. In Nazareth, we have that. In Amman, we have that. In Damascus, in Beirut, church and, and mosque. In, in Cairo, church and mosque, you know, uh, lived. I, I say uh, they have rubbed shoulders throughout these centuries. You know, every morning, one of them would greet the, uh, the other and the other would respond. This is really the reality on the, uh, on the ground. And in fact, I should also mention that it was Omar al-Khattab. Let's remember that. The previous uh, rulers of Jerusalem, we talk about the Romans and the Byzantines, you know, they have uh, prohibited the Jews from living in, the, uh, in Jerusalem for centuries. For centuries, they were pre prevented from living in Jerusalem. And, of course, who allowed them back in the... I'm, I'm not talking about doing favors or anything, but I'm simply specifying something that happened and uh, credit goes back to Omar al-Khattab. In the Geniza manuscripts, these are Jewish manuscripts that uh, they found in, uh, in Cairo. They have basically uh, asked Omar al-Khattab to allow them back in Jerusalem, and he allowed them back. And they have lived in what, I mean, this is how what it says, in Souq al-Yahud. At the time, it was the Jewish market. And I take it that this is really where later on the Jewish quarter emerged. But the Jewish quarter never included the Moroccan uh, quarter that uh, was demolished in 1967. Literally, you talk about an ancient uh, neighborhood, the Moroccan, uh, and of course it's Waqf, and it did include a school and a mosque, okay, al afdaliya It was literally erased uh, by bulldozers, literally. Uh, there are videos of this, uh, uh, you know, demolishing uh, centuries old, a neighborhood, a mosque, and a, uh, and a school. And uh, just just so much rich history. Thank you, uh, thank you so much for the work that you do. I don't want to end this without you giving us some words of hope um, for the future, for the Palestinian struggle to free Al Aqsa from Zionist occupation. Uh, do you have any 
do you have any just just basic words of hope for the future? Are you just always hopeful regardless of the circumstances? I, I mean, you you live there. I live here, and I, uh, in fact, let me put it this way: I fell under occupation as a nine years old, uh, you know, uh, boy, ten years old, nine years old. This was 1967. I was born 1958, so you can calculate that. Today, uh, I'm 65 years old, so I spent uh, practically uh, 58 years of my life under occupation. Uh, 57, 58. I think this is simply, uh, you know, there are certain th historical things that take place against your will. Things happen. These are a test uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not mean that we don't really change that which is evil for something uh, good. But I'm confident that there will be an end. It's simply a phase. You know, people, people would like to see it immediately. My father was very hopeful. He was extremely hopeful. He passed away. A few years ago, he was extremely hopeful. Okay, I'm extremely hopeful. Things will happen. I think I, I personally have my my own understanding uh, of uh, because I you know because both previous times of conquering Jerusalem, we talk about Fath Umari, we talk about Fath uh, Salah Al Ayubi. Uh, both of them, there was absolutely no blood shed in Jerusalem. And I, I believe that, you know, this is really, uh, I hope, inshallah, I hope so, that really getting rid of the occupation does not mean, does not equate, you know, does not mean, you know, blood shedding and what have you. But the way I see you, I see the future. It's going to remain a mosque, inshallah. I have no doubt about this. Um now, how do we, at Al-Aqsa Mosque today, when I uh, held my daily lecture uh, before the uh, noon prayer, uh, today I had a prolonged lecture uh, about Imam Al-Ghazali. And uh, this is, uh, uh, we were having good time. I mean, the, the situation is terrible. Situation is terrible. Going into Al-Aqsa Mosque, your ID is going to be checked, and I don't know what, and it could be registered on their iPads, they have like in the, on their system, and I have no doubt that it's going to be a beautiful uh, future. Uh, this is this is the way I am. Um, I'm a good, uh, you know, a student of history, so it's not really a naivete there. Okay, I'm, I'm really confident that uh, out of all the myths, something will uh, be beautiful and everlasting, inshallah. Allah, well, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your words of hope, your faith, and the work that you do on the ground, Dr. Mustafa Abu Sway. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your insight. Ramadan Mubarak. And um, inshallah khair. And um, I wish you all the best and all the best of health. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.